Japan up close. When I finally made it to the country 15 years ago now, uh, the first thing I did was to go and visit museums. This is something I do anywhere I travel in the world. Um, I studied art history in the Musée du Louvre in Paris, so I feel comfortable in museums. I used to spend time uh, in, in museums. Um, so that was a natural thing for me to do. And I thought it was a fantastic gateway into the culture be traditional or contemporary because by visiting museums you can uh, discover ancient culture as well as today's. Um, and it's not just about looking at works of art on the wall, you also um, get a sense of um, the architecture, the design, uh, how people behave. So you, know, you um, get a lot of clues while visiting museums, I find. And I uh, quickly realized that there was a fantastic number of museums in Japan. It was actually um, sometimes a little bit difficult to find information, especially when I started going as a non-Japanese speaker. So um, this is what led me to start a research project and to write my book. I really wanted to convey how um, interesting the museum scene was in Japan. Uh, this wasn't something that was uh, obvious to everybody at the time and how varied the museum scene is. Um, um, so really it was a sort of a childhood passion that led me to have this professional project later on. Well, the most obvious difference, I think, is the number of rotations um, of presentation during the year. Uh, objects change much more often uh, than in their Western counterparts. And this is due to a variety of factors. Um, the first one, um, I suppose, is the, um, the fragility of the objects. Most paintings are on paper or on silk, they're very fragile, so they cannot be on display for a long period of time. They need to be rotated. But there are um, more sort of deep cultural reasons also for these um, uh, regular rotations. Works of art in, in earlier centuries in Japan were not meant to be on permanent displays in one's home um, or temple. Uh, they would be changed according to um, who was coming to visit that day of a particular event. And beyond that um, cultural motivation, uh, there is also a more practical one, um, which is due to the fact that a lot of museums are actually of a modest size in, in Japan. So they don't have enough room to show uh, all of their collection at one given time. So they need to rotate um, their collections. And I also feel that because there are so many museums, there is some sort of a healthy competition. And to attract visitors, they need to propose uh, new exhibitions all the time. So uh, the 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 change in display and the number of um, special exhibitions seems to be higher to me than um, uh, uh, with their Western counterparts. Um, I also think they have posit positive, particular positive points in the fact that they attract perhaps people who are not very keen to go to museums, um, uh, you know, um, naturally and who are not attracted by the encyclopedic type of museum. So this is a different experience that attracts maybe younger people. Um, so I'm thinking about a few striking examples. Um, for example, the Teshima Museum on Teshima Island, that's part of the Naoshima group of museums. Um, and it's a fabulous place. It's a magical building, completely unusual, where um, you enter and you can lie down on the floor, you're surrounded by um, the sounds of nature, you can see your birds can fly in and out. Um, and it's a collaboration between Ryue Nishizawa, the architect, and Rei Nato, the artist. Um, and that's often the case, these um, museums have a very strong uh, collaboration between artists, one artist of more than one, and an architect. Um, other museums by Ryu and Nishizawa um, that I can think of um, is the Hiroshi Senju Museum Karuizawa. There, the architect collaborated with uh, the 
painter to create a unique structure, also quite open to the element and the landscape paintings of the, the artist mix and blend beautifully with the, um, the museum. So that shows really the importance of the role of the architect in this type of museum. Um, uh, there is also one of the first ones, I suppose, um, that I, the earliest one that I saw in Japan is the Nagi Museum of Contemporary Art, um, which is in a quite a remote location in Okayama Prefecture. And um, the, the, the architect um, names is Arata Isozaki. He built the museum in 1994, so quite early on, because the other museums I mentioned were built in recent years. Um, but he got the Pritzker Prize of Architecture, I believe, just last year. So he's a very important Japanese architect. And that particular museum is um, quite intellectual. Um, it's made of three geomet geometrical shapes that just placed like this on the lawn. And each room has been given to one or a duo of artists um, to create something quite conceptual. Um, and it's very striking, it's very strong. I, my, the only sort of negative point I think with this type of museum is that they, it can not only be about the building, it cannot be an empty shell. The works on display and the program of exhibition needs to be interesting and meaningful. Otherwise, how do you keep on attracting visitors? You know, museums cannot just have uh, lots of visitors the first few years they open because they attract architectural buffs. You need to make sure that you, you know, you have a long lifespan. Uh, so this is the only thing that sometimes worries me a little bit about this type of museums beyond the first uh, very exciting visit because you're in such a wonderful environment. How do you maintain, um, you know, a healthy number of visitors? What attracts me in a museum, what I'm looking for in a way, is a museum that has a personality, uh, that says something um, a little bit different than others um, by its architecture, its design, the collection, the presentation. Something really, yes, I, I like to talk about personality. Um, and I think museums have a history uh, to say, a story to tell. Uh, why are they there? Um, why did you choose that particular architect? What kind of collection? Why do you do these exhibitions? So th this is really what interests me. Um, but to answer your question a bit more specifically, the kind of museum that um, never ceases to amaze me and um, uh, transport me somewhere uh, are the artist houses. Um, I think it's a very good way to immerse yourself in an artist. You know, um, creation, but also his own life uh, and times. Um, they tend to be time capsules that are you know, fascinating. Another thing that moves me when I visit these museums is to see the, archi the preserved uh, traditional architecture. This is something that's very close to my heart, the preservation of architecture of all periods. Um, it's an issue in Japan in some places, old buildings are uh, taken down for a variety of reasons. They're not always protected. So these type of museums allow you to discover um, architecture from a different period and really experience it as you enter and walk through the room. So that, that they're very close to my heart. I really believe that uh, museums are the best excuse to travel around the country. They are dotted all over Japan. So to me, it's always been the best excuse to go and travel somewhere even remote to um, discover a particular collection. And as you do so, you see the scenery, you discover regional culture. So it's really worth taking the time to travel. It's easy in Japan. The infrastructure is great, trains and flying is easy. Um, and there are fantastic things in, um, in the countryside. I'm thinking about uh, um, a museum in um, Hokkaido in the north. Um, and which the Kanyasuda Museum of Sculpture, um, just outside a small mining town. Um, and the museum is on the um, boundary of a forest. Um, you act, there are actually signs saying that you have to be careful of bears during your, your visit. Um, so you're very close to nature and uh, it's a wonderful museum. Uh, which uh, Kanyasuda, the artist, really contributed to um, 
bring to life and then keep alive um, throughout the years. And maybe the last um, uh, advice, it might sound a bit mundane, but I've done it enough to know that it makes your life easier when you're doing a visit, to think about your shoes as you set off in the morning for your visit. Of course, they have to be comfortable, but something that you can sleep on and off easily is uh, always a plus in Japan. Because you're often asked to remove your shoes in museums. For sure, if the museum is located within a historical home, you would have to remove your shoes at the entrance as you would do in any private residence. But I've noticed also that a number of modern well, contemporary museums also ask you to do that. Um, for example, you go and see a tea room in that museum or a particular gallery when uh, a particular ambience wants to be created. I'm thinking about, um, for example, the Monet Room in the Chichu Museum of Naoshima. Uh, you can visit most of the museum with your shoes on, but there is a um, a particular gallery uh, where uh, you are asked to remove your shoes before entering. Then I think once you're in the room, everybody understands why, because not wearing shoes means that there is a very, um, the, the noise level is reduced. So everybody also um, lowers their voices or remain silent and um, people walk more slowly somehow. It just changes the ambience. Um, for some reason, and uh, there is um, a lot of reverence uh, in that room in particular, I find. So it has an effect on, on how you visit the museum. So it's just a tip, but um, I hope that it would be useful for visitors. Japan up close.